when I started working on yachts, I started to understand that you needed to invest in assets to build long-term generational wealth and to, to sort of you know, build financial freedom. Now, we recently facilitated a long-term lease. Uh, it was a 15-year lease on 107 units over Coventry and Wolverhampton, split over, I think it was four blocks for one housing association. So uh, our arrangement fee on that was £1,000 per unit, which comes to £107,000. What's up, lovely people? Welcome back to another video right here on Entrepreneur Podcast Club. I'm your host, Mr. EPC. Give a big, massive round of applause to my very special guest, Jack. So welcome to the show, first and foremost. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much for your time. So you've recently made six figures from a deal so what is it that you do in order to close that deal and get in that deal? Um, so we, we, we made six figures on, on two different blocks that we source for a client. So maybe I'll just talk about what it is that I do first. Yeah. So I run a company called Blockland with a few of my business partners and we specialize in sourcing um, freehold blocks for sale or for lease. Um, and as part of that, we, we reach out, we connect with housing associations, uh, social, social housing providers, supported living providers, and we help them find blocks that, that they need to lease. So we facilitate those leases and we charge an arrangement fee. Now, we recently facilitated a long-term lease. Uh, it was a 15-year lease on 107 units over Coventry and Wolverhampton, split over, I think it was four blocks for one house, housing association. So. Uh, our arrangement fee on that was £1,000 per unit, which comes to £107,000 on one wow. deal. Okay, so in terms of the flats, are they high-rise flats or are they different types of flats? So th they tend to be a mixture, um, one bed units, studios, two beds. Um, the, this housing association is using them for emergency housing, so they've got a broad range of tenant types. So th th they can take pretty much any any sort of unit um, within reason. Okay, and in terms of how you got into this, how did you get into this? Um, well, we were sourcing blocks um, for sale first of all, and then naturally, as you're speaking to, as you speak to the owners of blocks, um, th they want to secure long-term leases. We want to make a fee from helping them secure those long-term leases. So, uh, building relationships with housing associations was na a natural progression for us. And it actually turned out to be a much more um, a, a much more sustainable business model as well, because I'm sure, as you're probably fully aware, sales in property tend to fall through all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had multiple deals agreed and then fall through. Whereas agreeing a lease is a lot more straightforward and a lot more simple. You get paid a lot quicker because the legal process is a lot shorter. So th there's a lot less that can go wrong, and and you get paid quite handsomely for it. So. We've been focusing very much on that business model more recently rather than the sales. Okay, and in terms of training, did you get yourself a mentor in order for him or her to train you to actually, you know, source these deals? Yeah, 100%. So I'm pretty new to property. I haven't been doing it long and I still very much consider myself a beginner. Mm -hmm. um, I've only been in property for probably two years and uh, I, I started getting into property um, before I left my previous job, which was uh, working as an engineer on a private yacht. And <clears throat> I started looking into property. I actually did a HMO course by a guy called Neil McCoy Ward. Don't think he's a property trainer anymore. He, 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 does, he still does YouTube videos. Don't think he does property training so much anymore. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then I, I, I found Saj Hussain online on, on YouTube, watching some of his videos, and I went to a property meet in Birmingham at his, uh, his training center there in Birmingham. And uh, I ended up becoming a student of Saj's. I joined his inner circle and uh, learned that way. It really sort of accelerated my learning. I went from not having any property knowledge to just studying, and it took a long time before I even got a single well, before I made any money at all in property, and there's a lot of you know hurdles to overcome, ups and downs, 
uh, failed deals, mistakes that you make. It's not. It's certainly not the uh, the overnight success story that everybody talks about on social media. Mm. Um, it's not as straightforward as that. It's a lot harder than people make out. Well, it was for me anyway. I'm sure there are people out there who have yeah. overnight success stories. Okay. And in terms of you mentioned there that your took you quite a while to get your first deal. How long did it take you to get your first deal? It was probably. It must have been. It was over a year before I even. Uh, agreed a first deal and then the first deal I ever agreed it was the sale of uh, 10 flats because we we went straight to sourcing blocks I don't <laughs> I don't I don't know I didn't make it easy on myself we yeah. went straight to sourcing blocks and it was the sale of 10 flats in Birmingham uh, it was 1.35 million agreed purchase price and so our fee was 2% of the sale and um, wow. that that ended up well, that comes to £27,000. And we had that deal agreed. Um, it was in legals. And then as property deals do, it fell through. And of course, it was the first deal that I ever agreed. We were going to get paid £27,000. Grand, so we were all, you know, super happy and excited about it. And, and then that fell through. And it, it really, like, set me back for a long, a long time. I, I, I wanted to quit. And you get really hung up on one deal. And then when it doesn't come off, it just, it's totally devastating. But we kept going anyway, and I'm very glad that we did. We've got lots of stuff planned in the pipeline for the future of the business. And it's, it's now doing very well. As I said, we've made six figures in the last two months from, from one deal. And we've got more of those in the pipeline as well. We've just sourced another 100 units down in Brighton for the same housing association. That's not agreed yet, but uh, if that does come off, that will be another six figures. Wow, okay, fantastic. So it looks like you're doing really well, but it did take you a bit of time as it does. Because when yeah. you look at social media, even myself, we look at all these property guys, mm. they're like, oh yeah, you can make X amount. Yeah. But it's not that straightforward, is it? No, it's certainly not. And they don't, I mean, it, when you boil down a, a, a complex strategy to a five minute or even like a 30 second video where you're talking about BRR, you know, mm. buying it at below market value, doing it up. Um, getting a higher valuation and then refinancing it. That sounds amazing on paper. And you know the numbers work when you put it down on paper like that. But very rarely does it happen like that. There's complications along the way. There's, there's fees involved all along the way with finance, with solicitors, you know, conveyancing. And uh, very rarely does it go as smooth as people make out. You do find that, that there are some, you know, the, these all money out BRR deals are very, very rare to come across. Mm. Very yeah. rare to come across. You can, you can get good BRR deals where you get the majority of your cash out the deal and within a year or two, you're probably fully out. Um, but it's very rare uh, to find a deal that you get all of the money out on, on you know, the first refinance. Yeah, 100%. So there's a lot of trainers out there who tend to say, yeah, you could do this, do that, who aren't credible. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're getting mentored by Saj, who's a very credible guy. Mm. So if someone's watching this and looking for a property mentor, what advice could you give them and what due diligence should they take when selecting the mentor? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question because there's a ton of property trainers out there now. It seems to be hot topic. Um, most people seem to be selling a course rather than actually doing property themselves. Mm. Yeah. So uh, it's... It's difficult because I was my my answer would be social proof, but what the, the, the thing is as well, like with a lot of these trainers, they tend to become very cult like, where the people around them will never say anything bad about them, won't call them out on things if they do something bad. So you can't even really fully rely upon social proof. Um, you can use it to sort of uh, as a as a guiding compass, but the way I would look into things is just listen to what they're saying and see if they can they can back it up so you know for example Saj he's he's got he's a serial entrepreneur he's got multiple companies across multiple different sectors within property you can look all of those companies up on company's house and see if he's actually doing what he say he's doing so uh, service city apartments is short stay business um, you can go on company's house and look up the last two years' accounts and you can tell that they're doing you know, six figures in turnover, seven figures in turnover in a year nice. um, and how that's progressed. And the, the same thing for his HMO business, same thing for his uh, Uber property care business. 
um, he's he's doing what he says he's doing and he's teaching it as well so yeah. okay so I will put Sadie's uh, link to his website in the description box below so if you are looking for a credible mentor then do check out Saj uh, he does have networking events every month as well yeah. so if you are about in the Birmingham area do go and check the networking event out so let's talk about yourself now so where were you born and bred so I was raised in Wolverhampton from a working-class family uh, lived there until the age of 16 years old and then I left Wolverhampton and I went and joined the British Army where I served eight years as a Royal Engineer. Um, served overseas in a, a few different places, was fortunate never to have to go to a war zone. Okay. So did uh, Canada, Kenya, the Falkland Islands, all on different exercises and then I left the Armed Forces in 2018 and I went and worked on private yachts as, as an engineer. Okay. Uh, living on board private yachts, sailing around the, the Mediterranean and the Caribbean, just sort of maintaining the yachts for, for the very, very rich owners, charter, who, and, and some guests as well who were coming to charter the yachts. Okay, so let's talk about when you joined the army. Yeah. So what made you join the army? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question and you know what, I don't really have a great answer to that one. I was 16 years old, well I was actually 15 when I made the decision to join mm. and signed up and I, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing as most 15 year olds don't mm. and um, I just remember that the army, they came to our school, they did like a little open day and a talk and then I went away and did like a weekend work experience with them as well. And I just, I was really, you know, obsessed with, jo with joining. At first I wanted to actually join the infantry and uh, I was quite, you know, dead set on that. But if you're under the age of 18 in the UK, your parents have to sign a, a consent to say, yeah, I'll give permission for my child to join the armed forces. And so they refused to sign the consent form. And they, they said, you're not joining the army if, uh, if you're gonna go in the infantry and I, I despised them for it and you know I proper threw my toys out the pram I said look if you don't sign it I'm just going to wait till I'm 18 and I'm going to go in anyway so you're just going to waste two years of my life and they said look okay we'll sign it if you promise to join and get a trade and I said okay then and I ended up joining I just picked any random trade it was the Royal Engineers I joined as a, as a fitter which is a, a plant mechanic Hmm. And I, I hated them at the time for it, but I look back on that now and, oh my word, I'm so thankful that they did that because <laughs> it got me a trade uh, and when I got out of the, the forces, I walked straight into a job and I, it actually turned out that I really, really enjoy engineering and, uh, and, and I'm very passionate about it. It's just extremely lucky that I fell into it like that. Um, but yeah, the, it was very happy circumstance that they just said no and forced me down the right path. Yeah. Okay. So parents always know best, don't they? <laughs> in that <laughs> case, that yes. Way. Okay. So in terms of currently, mm. you you got your property business. Yeah. Are you currently working at the moment as well? Yeah. So in between, you know, the, the problem with selling blocks of, of, of apartments is uh, one deal can take a year to complete. Okay. And I've only been doing this for two years. Yeah. So the, the cash flow is very, very lumpy. You know, you get a large, large lump sum and then you don't know when the next one is coming. So it can be very tricky in that sense um, to plan your finances ahead. So all of the money that we have made in that business has pretty much stayed in that business. And I've remained at work contracting as, a, as an engineer at JLR. Um, and I work about probably an average of 45 hours a week there. And then I, I work on the business in my spare time weekends, evenings, whenever I can fit it in. Okay, and you mentioned previously, you mentioned we, when you mentioned your property business. Yeah. So who is we? Do you have multiple business partners? Or? Yeah, so I've got, I've got three business partners, uh, Kevin Cox, who yeah. runs Regional Property Meets, Jordan Gamble, who owns an estate agency called Easy, in conjunction with Kev as well, they both run that agency, Easy, and Jay Scott, who is part of Steve Hamilton's The Property Circle deal sourcing division. He heads up the, the deal sourcing division in conjunction with, with Kev. Uh, those three are my business partners in Blockland. 
Okay, so how did you all meet and how did you know you were all a good fit for each other in terms of business-wise? Yeah, it's quite funny actually. I mean, I, I, I started sourcing blocks by myself and I, I was sending hundreds, thousands of direct-to-vendor letters to owners of blocks. Um, and I guess at the time, I didn't really have much of a plan in place. I was sending these letters and I was getting leads and I was getting um, blocks that I was trying to sell, but I didn't have an investor database to sell to. I hadn't built a client database. And I knew that Kev was looking for blocks to sell because they had a database of investors. So I went to regional property meet, Kev's um, networking event. I, I met Kev and I just basically spoke to them about them selling my leads and it ended up that we just started working together it all came together and then that's what uh, that's how blockland became what it is today and we we put the business together we took equal shareholding okay fantastic so we'll put the link to your website yeah in the description box below and all your social media links as well yeah that'd be great so you mentioned there about um finding blocks of flats yeah so without giving too much trade secrets away, um, what is the high level process that you do in order to get the, get the vendors to call you and try and you know, sell you their blocks yeah. or lease them? Yeah, so basically we're doing a, a lot of direct to vendor marketing. In total, we've sent you know, upwards of sort of five to 6,000 direct to vendor letters and then in terms of remarketing we've sent upwards of you know 15,000 and that's to individual blocks around the West Midlands. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that we've sent a letter to almost every block in the West Midlands <laughs> to the owner of them anyway and we do that by identifying uh, multiple council tax registrations under one freehold title which would indicate a multi-unit freehold block we're not really interested in blocks that have already had the leasehold uh, created and split up because the, attra the attractive um, you know, proposition about buying a block is that you own the entire block and you know, it's, it's multi-unit, it's freehold. The, one of the, the main reasons and one of the main things that our clients buy blocks is they can use creative strategies like title splitting to add value, which is a very interesting property strategy which can essentially create added value to a block out of thin air without even having to do much more than a paperwork exercise. Okay. So, uh, and you can do that on entry and you can do it on exit. So we help our clients put together uh, something called title splitting finance with one of our, our partners that we work with, which enables them to title split a block on entry and finance the purchase based off of the split value rather than the freehold value. So that sometimes can enable people to either drastically reduce a deposit or in eliminate it entirely because of the value that you've created on title splitting a block. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I think it's gone over my head a bit <laughs> as we're talking. Um... So title splitting, it's like the, it's like I would compare it to you know, imagine you go to the shop and you buy a multi-pack of Kit Kats, mm. like four Kit Kats for two pound, and then you, or say for one pound fifty, and then you sell them for fifty pence each, and you and you make two pound, right? Because you've broken it up, and now they're worth more individually. That's the same thing with a multi-unit freehold block. As a as an entire block under one title, it's worth less than if they're split up and sold to residential buyers, and that's simply because as as one block, it can only be sold to an investor who's looking for a return on their money. So if you say take a block that is, you know, it's one million pounds and it's making a hundred thousand pounds in rent a year, that's a 10% yield, right? Mm. And blocks are valued based off of the income they, they produce. It's a return on investment for an investor. So they'll only ever be worth so much to an investor based on the rental income. Mm. Now you can combine strategies by finding blocks where landlords haven't put the rent up for a long period of time, they're under rented and because of that they're, they're valued lower commercially because they don't provide a good income. So you can create value on buying a block by buying a block that's under rented, vacant and then 
title splitting it and selling it on the residential market. Okay, some really good chunks of information there for anyone that's watching. So, <laughs> in terms of the creative strategies, mm. there is another guy that does all the teaches about creative strategies, Shimon Rubich, yeah. about lease option agreements and stuff like that. Yeah. So, he works very closely with Saj as well. He does, yeah. So, did he teach you some of the slicing and dicing, lease option agreements, etc.? So I've learned uh, a lot from Shimon, yeah, he's done a few sessions for the Inner Circle that I've had the pleasure of being involved with. And yeah, he's, he's spoken a lot about lease options and one of our most recently agreed deals actually was a purchase lease option for one of our clients on a block of 14 flats in Kidderminster. Okay. That was a housing association who's looking to lease the block and then after seven years they will complete the purchase at a pre-agreed price. It's very, very attractive proposition for them because um, they can add value to the block in that seven years and it's obviously going to appreciate in value over that seven years mm -hmm. So come seven years down the line when they when they come to purchase that they'll most likely be purchasing it Without putting any any capital down at all. In fact, they'll probably be pulling equity out of the deal so rather than just going in and leasing a block for seven years uh, and and at the end of it having to give it back after they put CCTV in they furnished it They've looked after it the whole time then they have to hand it back with us if we agree a deal like that on their behalf They don't have to hand it back at the end. They purchase the block. Okay, right So let's talk about your the future plans uh, For your business. So yep. what are the future plans for your business your property business? Yeah, so Blockland has primarily up until this point been uh, an off-market platform for high net worth investors to come in and look at our stock of blocks that we have uh, and, and purchase those or lease those blocks if they're a housing association. And we've sort of hit a bit of a bottleneck in the business, which is that our method of sourcing leads is, is very capital intensive. We have to obviously send a lot of letters, they don't always generate the best amount of responses and in order to get the, the addresses of the, the owners of these blocks we need to purchase title registers if they're privately owned Okay. so we can get their address, we can send them a letter and speak directly with the owner and so it's a, it's a capital intensive process where we're spending thousands of pounds to send thousands of letters and uh, we are switching up the model in the sense that we we're, we're going to be looking to move the platform from us sourcing the leads to us working directly with local agents and national agents and splitting our fees with them similar to you know the likes of what I am sold do uh, with their modern method of auction they'll go get the leads from local agents and they sell those leads on behalf of those agents and then they split the fees with them okay. and, and that's what we'll be looking to do as well and we'll be looking to build a very very large marketplace of blocks within the UK and we, we're hoping to be you know when if somebody needs to sell a block they think Blockland mm. if you want to buy a block you think Blockland that's yeah. what we're hoping to become within the UK there's not really a specialist platform like that out there at the moment if you want to buy a block of flats it's either done you know deals under the table between friends or it's done at auction and with, with exceptionally high fees at auction as well and so we're really hoping to become that, that platform where you know uh, the, the name that you think of when you want to purchase a block would be Blockland. Okay and um, in terms of other people that are selling blocks of land, mm. not, not blocks of land, sorry blocks of flats, yeah. do you collaborate with them and liaise with them as well? Yes we 100% do. Um, over the past two years we've worked with many different people because as I say there's some difficulty to sourcing the leads that we sell so we've, we have worked with other sources to get more leads and to, to find buyers as well now you know what I'm not a hundred I'm not really keen on working with sources because and this is probably a controversial opinion but there's a lot of people out there that are just full of shit mm. <laughs> and Unfortunately, you know, people talk a good game, but they don't put the money where their mouth is. And you get, you know, led down the garden path for months on end, and then something doesn't come off. Or simply, um, you know, it's a saucer 
who's working with another sourcer, who's working with another sourcer, who's working with the vendor. And there's about five or six people in between. It gets so messy and we just, we're not interested in doing that anymore and we've moved away from that. We do work with, with sourcers who are credible and we know are reliable, but they can only be them direct to the vendor or them direct to the investor. It's not sourcer, 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 vendor <laughs> or sourcer, 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 investor. It has to be direct and they need to also know what they're doing because at the end of the day, if we are committing a deal that we've sourced to their investor, then, then we need to be sure that that's going to be completed because we've put all the work in up to this point and we don't want it to get it, get it dragged out down the line and then it fall through and then we lose that connection with our vendor. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's happened a few times. Uh, it's happened, I mean, it happens with us direct with our vendors as well. It does, it's not necessarily always the source's fault, but we're trying to, we're trying to minimize that, the scenarios where that happens. Okay, because, you know, when I go to networking events, speak to people, what do you do? They say deal sourcing. I'm like, how yeah. many deals have you sold? None. Yeah. So how are you a deal sourcer? Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I am a big advocate for people, you know, getting involved in property. Mm -hmm. I really am because, I, and I think it's great and people can make a lot of money in deal sourcing and in property, but people start in the wrong place. They go out and they rush off and they start like going on viewings and offering like 25, 30% below market value before ever even um, getting an understanding of the process and of negotiation and just hoping you know, that they'll strike lucky. And it's the, it's the wrong way to go about it, really. You need to start with education. And it doesn't cost a lot to get education. You can do it for free on YouTube. A lot of these trainers have got most of their content on YouTube anyway. They do keep a little bit behind for, you know, their, their courses and stuff. But most of the stuff is on YouTube if, if you look in the right places. And... Um, yeah, I am a big advocate for people getting involved in property. Yeah, I think that they should, but people need to uh, to go out and learn the process first, rather than just, you know, going off half cocked and <laughs> trying to source <laughs> like ten deals in their first month. Yeah, absolutely. Because I do know one person who I met at a networking event, mm -hmm. and we're actually quite, become quite good friends. And then he hasn't paid for any training. Well, he's actually done all of his educational from YouTube and yeah, yeah. social media and he's doing quite pretty well. You can do it. I mean, it, there's, it's all there. Everything is on YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube mm. nowadays. you just got to know where to look. And basically, what all, the, all that most of these property trainers are doing is putting it in a structured framework. Whereas when you're learning yourself on YouTube, it's not in a structured framework. It's a lot harder to know what to do next. So that's the struggle with doing it yourself is having a pathway, a roadmap to show you, okay, I've learned this now, now I need to go and learn that, and then I learn that. And, and understanding the direction in which you should be moving, that's normally what a property trainer or somebody, a mentor, anybody would, would, would give you over somebody who, who doesn't have a mentor. It's not so much about the content that you get from going privately with them, it's more about the direction, the structure, the roadmap that they put you on. 100%. Okay. So you mentioned off camera as well when we were speaking that you've got another business as well. Yeah. So what is the other business that you got? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a company called Brown's Biltong. Brown is my last name. And Biltong is a South African dried beef product. Okay. It's similar to jerky, but it's sort of sacrilege to call it jerky because it's not. It's a lot nicer, in my opinion. And um, without being biased, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's it's just a, it's a high protein dried beef snack, basically. Uh, it's strips of beef that are seasoned, um, marinated in vinegar, and hung to dry for six to seven days, and then sliced thinly. And uh, we pre-package that and sell that direct to consumers via our website. It's a small business at the moment. And it's been an, it, it, do you know what? It's been a very interesting learning curve running a, a, a food business, a fast moving consumer goods business as well, uh, because there's a hell of a lot of red tape involved and it's a lot harder than property. Um, mm. It's a hell of a lot harder. There's so much that goes into it um, and there's so many pitfalls and traps and very expensive initial outlay which is, I mean, why I love property, part of the reason is you can get started for almost nothing. 
mm. almost nothing. But with companies like making Biltong or any sort of you know uh, consumer goods business, there's in order to be to do well, there's there's a lot of initial outlay. Uh, for equipment, you know, packaging, marketing, setting up the website, all of those things cost money, especially food consultation mm. um, in regards to he uh, health and safety for food. It's, that's, that is very expensive. Yeah, so in terms of that business, is that solely in the UK, all the manufacturing, the packaging, selling, etc.? Yeah, that's solely based in the UK. Like I say, we are still a small business, so we're not, it's not, we're not doing hundreds of thousands. We're doing, you know, sort of multi-five figures, but it's, uh, it's getting there and it's being built up slowly. It's, it's more, more than anything, it's, it started off for me as a hobby, actually. Um, my wife is South African, hence why okay. I'm, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we travel to South Africa a few times a year and it, over there it's absolutely everywhere biltong is and I eat it all the time I absolutely love the stuff yeah. it's it's like crack to me <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I just can't stop eating it but that's why I started making it myself at home because in the UK it's so expensive to buy mm. uh, it's extremely expensive so I started making it myself from there started selling it to friends um, well mostly giving it away to friends then selling it to friends and then it just one of my very good friends Reese, he actually um, we were sat at the pub of all places yeah. and he said why don't we make a business out of this you know it's a really great product there's great markup on the product you know you're very good at making it why don't we make it into a business and that's that's how it basically developed um, and, and has has progressed since then as well Okay, so what are the plans for that business in the future? Yeah, so I'm a 50% shareholder alongside my, my friend Reese in that business. Now, my plans for the future are to step back from that and be more of a, a, an oversight and sort of guiding, a guiding force on that rather than being heavily involved myself. Um, it's just simply not worth my time at the moment. We've got so much going on in property and block land is where my main focus is, especially with the successes that we've had in the past few months. So I really, it's for me, it's a toss up between, okay, where is my time best spent and where is it going to give me the most return on, on, you know, on, my, on my time? And at the moment, it's, it's at block land. I work at JLR and that keeps the bills on the, uh, the, the food on the table and the bills paid. Hopefully that will be getting put to bed soon as well. And uh, I work at Blockland because that's making the bulk of the money and that's where the future that I see being the most profitable. Uh, Browns is certainly still going to be a, f uh, a thing going forwards, but I will be more of a, you know, like just overseeing that and Reese will be stepping up to the plate and taking on more responsibility in that business himself, paying himself from that business and, and running it uh, in its entirety with me sort of keeping hold of the, the, the activities like the sales direct to, uh, direct to shops and, and uh, retail buyers. Okay, fantastic. So what is the best thing about property? Um, well, I really think that the, the best thing is how accessible it is to, to just about anybody who, you know, if you've got 50 pound, you can go and set up a company, or, uh, a business on company's <laughs> yeah. house. It's going up to fifty pound, isn't it? Yeah, from the first of May, twenty twenty-four. I was yeah. wounded when I saw that. But it <laughs> is what it is. Yeah, it's just it's it's the accessibility. Really, anybody can get started, and you know, I've always wanted to invest in property, and you know, some I can't remember who told me, but it's a very good way of looking at it. Is like you wouldn't you wouldn't try and win a game of Monopoly uh, by just going round the board and passing go. Would you? Which is, but that's the way most people will try and and live their lives. They will just go around. They'll roll the dice. They'll collect their salary each month when they pass go, and they'll never buy assets. And um, for me, like I, I, I understood. I mean, probably when I started working on yachts, I started to understood understand that you needed to invest in assets to build long term generational wealth and to to sort of you know, build financial freedom. 
and that's what I started doing. You know, you wouldn't, like I say, you wouldn't go around a Monopoly board just collecting money at go, not buying assets. And everybody knows as well that the real success starts to come when you build those houses on free properties that you own, you build the, the hotels and you really start to rake in the money. And that's the same in life. You need to go out, you need to buy assets, whether it be property, whether it be businesses, whether it be commodities, whatever your asset class of preference might be, you're not going to um, build high levels of wealth by just collecting a paycheck and working for someone else's dreams for your entire life. Yeah, that's some really good advice there, especially like investing in assets as well. Mm. So you mentioned there about the yachts as well. Yeah. So what was the best thing about working on the yachts? Yeah, so when I started working on yachts, I, I'd left the army. I was quite disillusioned with, with the army. I, I didn't want to be there anymore. I sort of reached a point where I was fed up with it. And don't get me wrong, I was very, very glad of my time that I spent in the forces. It made me a much better person, taught me some very you know, core principles that I carry with me still to this day. But after eight years, I was very disillusioned with it. They don't pay very well. And so I left the army in about £20,000 worth of debt. And I, uh, I didn't really have much of a plan. I just handed my notice in. Luckily, you, well, I say luckily, it's, you have to hand a one year's notice in the army. Really? Yeah, one year's notice. So I had one year to plan. And I, I ended up going down to Portsmouth for a, a job interview with a recruitment agency called YPI Crew, who they crew super yachts. I gave them my CV and within two weeks I was away on, and working on board a private yacht. And that was the first time in my life I had, I had spare cash left at the end of the month and I didn't know what to do with it. For the first time in my life, I wasn't just paying off debt and living paycheck to paycheck. I had extra money in the bank. And funnily enough, when you have an abundance of money, you start to think, okay, well, what should I do with it? Mm. And that is when I really started to get clued up on and looking at different options, investing, looking at uh, putting money into property. And uh, it, it's quite sad really that that's what it took. And it's sad that unfortunately there's a lot of people out there that will never have that because they'll never have an abundance. They'll just be stuck on the hedonic treadmill going round and round. And I didn't realize that that's how I was before until that happened. but. I had like, yeah, it was a bit of like an epiphany. Once you start to, to have excess, you start to think, what should I do with it to best protect that and not just have it sat there in the bank. And that's what I really loved about yachting. It sounds very shallow to say that it was the money, but it would be, I mean, it really was because it's a very well-paid job. You don't pay tax because it's overseas. You, okay. you're, you're out of the country for more than six months a year. You get seafarers. I think it's a seafarer's allowance or something like that. Um, and so what I was making was take home pay in my pocket. You know, I was living on board the yacht, they pay for your food, they pay for your toiletries. So everything that I was earning was going straight in my pocket, investing and beer tokens as well when you're <laughs> out and about in the luxurious locations that, that, that you do tend to visit. Obviously, you know, these rich owners of yachts, they're not going to slums, they go into the very nice you know, the, the, the finest places in the Caribbean, in the Med, the south of France, you know, all, the, all of the places you would imagine a yacht owner would want to go. Mm. And so you do get to visit some fantastic places as well, which was another highlight. Okay. And in terms of some of these high net worth individuals, mm. are you still in contact with them? Uh, no, because the problem, I mean, it's when you're working on board the yacht, you have very little contact with the guests themselves. Um, and so you don't really build relationships with those people because it would be unprofessional to be mm. trying to socialize with the guests yeah. whilst you're on board. But you can take away a lot, a lot from seeing who comes on board and, you know, overhearing snippets of conversations, what these people are doing with their money, where they're putting their money. And funnily enough, I'd say probably 90% of the people who who came on board as a guest and the owner himself as well were investment bankers. Okay. At least 90% of them. Very rarely there was a celebrity um, and I think there was uh, the one, one time we had the franchise owners of McDonald's 
in the whole of Brazil on and mm -hmm. so the head franchisee in, in Brazil had brought on all of the franchise owners and took them on a on a holiday on a yacht and they they came on. That was probably one of the only ones really I can remember that weren't in some way involved in banking and investment banking. Okay. Wow, okay, fantastic. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for this podcast. I've been your host, Mr. EPC. Big shout out to Jack for coming through and mm -hmm. taking the time out to speak to me. And if you did like this podcast, please do hit that subscribe button and that notification bell as well. And I will put all of Jack's uh, social media links in the description box below. And do look out for the next podcast. And thank you very much for watching.